everybody. So glad to have you here. We are at Gettysburg Campaign 160. We are atop Carlisle, Pennsylvania at the old Carlisle Courthouse Cupola. And we've got special <laughs> guests with us today. And we're going to be talking about Carlisle. We're going to talk about the actions, not action, <clears throat> actions that happened here during the Gettysburg Campaign. We're going to talk about some civilian experience. And we got more to come about all this. Now, we hope you've already been enjoying our Brandy Station 160 coverage, our Chancellorsville 160 coverage. I hope you've been enjoying some of our budding Vicksburg and maybe even a little Port Hudson coverage as well. It's a big 160 year. We got a lot more coming. But first, I think we need to get into where we are. Carlisle is a super cool town. I've spent a lot of time up here. Um, it's got a lot to offer. And one of we got a local with us today, the barefoot historian herself. <laughs> We've got Courtney Coffin here to talk a little bit about Carlisle. Courtney, take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you. Welcome. Welcome to Carlisle. So lots of people know about Carlisle from the car shows, but it's often overlooked because of the, for the history. So Carlisle was founded in 1751, and it was originally the sort of the last outpost before heading out west. George Washington was here during the Whiskey Rebellion. Ben Franklin has spent time here. Alexander Hamilton. Lots and lots of things have happened here in Carlisle, and it's a fantastic town full of rich history and was a huge piece of the, you know, the Civil War puzzle. Good, a lot good. Of people overlook. Let me keep you on here for a sec, Courtney, because oh here we are in your town, and I'm going to unscript it, ask you a few things. And we've got tickets in college here. Yes. We've got uh, uh, the uh, Army Heritage Education Center yeah. here. We've got great restaurants, and we've got a shop that you sort of work in. What's going on there with the Barefoot <laughs> Historian? Sort of work in. The Barefoot Historian and Company is downtown in Carlisle's Historic District, next to the historic Carlisle Theater. We do all kinds of historic walking tours speaking engagements, obviously, uh, tin type photography. There's a lot going on, but we like to bring history to life. Great. So. Thanks, Courtney. So yeah. Courtney's the Barefoot Historian, and we're going to meet and co uh, <laughs> soon as well. So we'll get into that. Now, the reason we're in Carlisle for the Gettysburg campaign is, of course, because the troops came here. We're going to get into something that happens in late June. We're going to talk about something that happens in early July. But before we do this, please note the Gettysburg campaign is complex stuff. And uh, we encourage you to go back and watch our coverage off the top of my head. Go check out our Monterey Gap or Monterey Pass coverage. Check out our Cash Town coverage. Check out our uh, uh, either released already or just soon to be released, Wrightsville Bridge coverage. Look at uh, Williamsport and Falling Waters coverage that we've done. You could study just the Gettysburg campaign the rest of your life and not be all done. But in short, the Confederates have three corps. Each of those three corps of about 20, 25,000 soldiers have um, three divisions. And the corps we're talking about today mostly is going to be that of Richard Ewell, new corps commander. He's got three divisions. One goes off toward York and Wrightsville, marching through Gettysburg on the way. And the other two under Robert Rhodes and um, under Edward Allegheny, old clubby, old blinky Johnson uh, are going to come up here toward Carlisle. So, you know, we don't want to get into detail of regiments and brigades if we must once we're at battle, but when we're on the campaign, do it in terms of divisions. Aha! Early and Johnson and Rhodes are separated by dozens of miles. Maybe that's why they take different roads to actually get to Gettysburg and end up on different parts of the battlefield. And all that will help your Battle of Gettysburg uh, understanding solidify a little bit. Now, I'm not going to walk over there, but uh, you're with the American Battlefield Trust, and we've got guests with us today. You've already met Courtney. Now let's meet uh, Chris Jones. So that's Chris White behind the camera. Pivot it on over to Chris Jones. Chris Jones, take us up a little bit. You know, we've brought uh, Ewell to this part of Pennsylvania. Now we got to bring Ewell's divisions to Carlisle. What's going on here? Thanks, Gary. So as Ewell's Corps is marching up uh, through Chambersburg into Shippensburg, um, I'll fix my mic here a little bit. Uh, then they, they're fanning out a little bit. You have Albert Jenkins Cavalry in the lead. And a bit ahead of them is the 1st New York Cavalry. And the 1st New York Cavalry ride into Carlisle on June 27th. They're alerting the citizens, you know, the rebels are coming. And the town council, they have an impromptu meeting. What are we going to do about this? Well, they decide to ride out the Walnut Bottom Road to the south, uh, southwest of town, and they meet Albert Jenkins. And they say, listen, the barracks has been evacuated. There are no soldiers in town. We're, we're going to give up the town freely. We really hope that you do not charge wildly through the streets. And Albert Jenkins says to them, you know, I appreciate that, gentlemen. We have no disposition to charge wildly through the streets. And on the afternoon of June 27th, the first Confederate soldiers come into Carlisle. Now, they're here. 
The cavalry's here for a very short time. They levy a requisition on the town for astronomical numbers of things like 25,000 pounds of bacon. They ride on out toward Mechanicsburg, heading, of course, toward Harrisburg, whenever General Ewell, in his carriage, rides into the square of Carlisle. Now, he's met with the citizenry, and he tells them, I am not here to destroy your town. I am not here to do anything but gather supplies so my men can move on. He reminds the townspeople that he's familiar with Carlisle. He loves Carlisle. He was here in 1840 as a lieutenant of dragoons after getting out of West Point. And the town does rest a little easier, but they do still have to start gathering those supplies. Well, there is no town in this part of Pennsylvania that can come up with the kind of supplies that Ewell and Jenkins have levied on this town. So they search the town. They go door to door. And there was very strong feeling at that time that rebel search parties were piloted to different houses that were known to have large stores of goods. Now, the Confederates are here until June 30th. On June 30th, they get a note from Robert E. Lee that says, if you have not already progressed on the road and have no good reason to, do, to not do so, please bring your corps to Gettysburg where you will meet your other division of General Early. So Rhodes Division heads south. There is some action in the meantime of around Camp Hill, which was called Oyster Point, Sporting Hill outside of Harrisburg. Jenkins Cavalry comes back, everyone heads south. The town breathes this huge sigh of relief and then on the afternoon of July 1st, William Baldy Smith with the Department of Susquehanna, some New York State National Guard, Pennsylvania Emergency Militia, they ride, or, well, march and ride into Carlisle, and there is much rejoicing in the town. The town actually drags out trestle tables in the middle of the town square. The soldiers stack arms. They have an impromptu picnic. It is just the greatest thing that has happened in Carlisle, and then all of a sudden Confederate shells come out of nowhere. In the meantime, while all this is going on, Jeb Stewart's cavalry has been riding from Dillsburg using dated information, trying to link back up with the Confederate Army. He thinks Yule is still here. He rides up the, uh, the Trindle Road into Carlisle, and he sees men in gray uniforms, and he thinks, thank heavens, I found the Army. Turns out those gray uniforms were the New York State National Guard. So they open fire on Stewart. There's a little bit of an alert. Stuart fires, fires three shells over the town just to sort of announce his arrival in true Stuart, Stuart style. He then sends in a courier under a flag of truce out of the Brigade of General Fitzhugh Lee who says to Baldy Smith, surrender the town or we will shell. And Smith says, give me a minute, let me think about this. And he is met with some of the town civilians. He's met with his officers, and they all say, you know, it's probably a good idea if we just, you know, get the heck out of Dodge. But then he's met with a Union woman by the name of Polly McGinnis. And Polly McGinnis, uh, uh, Courtney, you could probably cover more of her. Yeah, yeah, but, she, but, she could. But, <laughs> but Polly McGinnis basically tells General Smith, do not surrender the town, General, so long as one brick stands on top of another. And so General Smith, in turn, tells the Confederate courier to shell away and be damned. And so Fitzhugh Lee orders the shelling. Captain Brethen's battery are just out on the east end of town, and they begin lobbing shells, initially more over the town. They're firing a little high and wide, just letting everybody in town know we mean business. Another Confederate courier is sent in, and, he, and Smith says, you tell General Lee I will see him in a much hotter climate before surrendering. So the Confederate leaves, more shells come in, the citizens are ducking for cover, the Union troops are ducking for cover. The shells are now raking High Street, grape shot, canister, case shot exploding all over. The old courthouse that we are in was hit numerous times, there are still marks from that today. And the third flag of truce comes in. This is about 10 o'clock in the evening on July 1st. And Smith simply says the answer has been given twice before. And the courier informs Smith very well, we will halt the shelling until 10 a.m., at which time Stewart's entire division will be in line and we will charge into the streets of town. Now, as we know from history, that's not what happened. About 3 o'clock in the morning, what would be July 2nd, the order comes from, from Lee down in Gettysburg to Major Venable of Stewart's staff, who tells him, all right, knock it off, we need you in Gettysburg and they head south toward the Holly Gap and rejoin Lee in Gettysburg. Now the next morning, the, the town, the soldiers, they wake up to find the Confederates are just simply gone. 
And that is the short version of what happened here in Carlisle. All right, well, let me, let, that, that's great, Chris. Let me add that I think someone's going to be in trouble tonight back at the Barefoot and Historian and Company because someone else was supposed to tell some civilian stories, and I'll get to that in just a second. They're going to switch mics here. A couple of things. One, he mentioned Oyster Point. Some people like to call that the high water mark of the Confederacy. Some people, of course, like to call Perryville, Kentucky the high water mark of the Confederacy. Y'all can talk about that, but you know, they are further north here. They are on the gates of the Pennsylvania capital when they're at Oyster Point or Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. So keep that in mind as well. Two, let me just deal with it because there's no doubt showing up in the comments already. Gettysburg versus Gettysburg. Chris and Chris pro properly pronounce the name Gettysburg. The guys they were eviscerated for it. Oh my God, you're going to just get destroyed. I say it wrong because I like the way Gettysburg sounds, but Gettysburg is correct. Um, third, there's so much going on during all this time, it's hard to keep it straight. Um, even during this time between when the Confederates arrive here and between when Jeb Stewart arrives here, think about what is going on. The Union is marching through Union Mills, Tawny Town, and whatnot. Look for our coverage on that as well. There's going to be a fight at Hanover. There's going to be fighting and skirmishing elsewhere. General Meade takes command of the Union Army. I mean, there was so much going on in studying the Gettysburg campaign. For my part, I still read Edwin B. Coddington, the Gettysburg campaign, to understand the whole thing. It's not the most exciting read, but it's a solid and a good read. Now, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. We're with the Barefoot Historian and Co. atop the old Carlisle uh, Courthouse here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. We've got Chris White behind the camera. Now, Courtney, do you have any civilian stories left after that <laughs> wanton takeover of all your best stories by Chris? R right? I mean, Polly McGinnis is a shining star, scrappy by nature. She was often called old Polly McGinnis, although I'm offended because she was in her early 30s, certainly not considered old by any means, um, but she absolutely absolutely was the driving force behind, you know, getting Smith to say absolutely not. I am fascinated by the civilian stories, though. Pennsylvania, and especially our area of Pennsylvania, they were not used to, they, they were used to hearing stories, reading accounts, but they certainly weren't used to it being at their front doorsteps. Um, so some of the interesting civilians are women like Annie Caldwell, whose husband was quite a prominent lawyer in town, and he decided to put on the uniform and go fight and was killed at Antietam, leaving her and her four children alone to fend for herself. She was actually here and already widowed by the time that the Confederates arrived. So that was especially terrifying. Um, you, just many, many stories of, of civilians, you know, who have had their whole lives upended because the of the, the yeah. Oh, the woman with the mattress. It, while Sean Carlisle is being shelled, there's a count of a woman who threw a mattress over her back to protect herself from <laughs> from falling shells by the mattress as she scurried away from the from the danger. So there are lots of stories like that. That's pretty great because I yeah. think of Civil War mattresses aren't like the Serta no. like four feet thick no. mattresses. They're like <laughs> no. this. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I have a civilian story that maybe you all will put in the comments. Maybe you're too generous to do this to me now. But I read this probably 30 years ago in Witness to Gettysburg by Richard Wheeler, I think is his name. Uh, you know, and it concerns, uh, you know, an area where the Confederates, you know, two divisions don't just camp in town. They're all over the place. And two guys are going off looking for food. I think they're from Louisiana. They try to pick some cherries from a tree. The farmer says, oh, not these two trees. Use any other trees that you want. And he, the, it turns out the other two trees were already the ones that all the other soldiers had picked through at that point. And in the meantime, they're not really getting much. The, they said that the food was all gone already. So these soldiers are just picking on some old, you know, shriveled cherries as best as they could. And then they hear a terrible noise. The old Dutch woman comes running out from the back saying, ah, you know, that, that's what she said. Ah. It's a direct quote. Yes, exactly. And it turns out that not the best horse they had because they'd taken all their best horses and moved them out of town, but their favorite horse, the old mare that had taken them through so many generations already um, uh, of, of work seasons, had walked through a yard where an old kind of uh, well or ice house had been covered up and it had fallen in and it was screaming, it was doubled up on itself. And these two soldiers worked, they were good at this stuff, got some tack and were able to fasten it around the horse. At the same time, someone was shoveling dirt under the horse's legs. This thing was 12 feet deep and they managed to raise the horse through the dirt and through the pulley um, wow. and got the horse out. They were so thankful that those people found some food for those Southern soldiers, wow. um, which is pretty interesting. And how many times must that have played out just for Pennsylvania, for Carlisle right. to be insulated for more and then one intense week or month? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know, when it comes right down to it, it's, it is a 
enemy versus friend situation, but it's human versus human. And we see so many moments in time where, you know, I mean, we have one that we talk about in the shelling itself, where there's a, a young Confederate man and he his feet are torn up and his feet are wrapped in bloody rags. And a citizen from Carlisle comes over and says, please take my shoes. It breaks my heart to see our boys, any of our boys, because we were all Americans at the time take my shoes, I have another pair at home. Um, so there, there are moments of humanity in, in this very terrifying you know, ordeal that we were all braving together. I, so. think, uh, I think that's great. It's also great to see the barefoot historian talking about, about you know, shoes. footwear and whatnot. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. Completely um, accidental. What I want to do is, because I know he has stuff to add, and he's been super patient so far, is we can flip that camera around. I'm going to point it back at Chris. He might have something to say about Carlisle Barracks. He might have something to say about regimental companies. Let's just see. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, everybody. Please hit the subscribe button, hit that bell notification, and check out everything we have at battlefields.org. Also, check out the uh, Barefoot Historian and Company, uh, who's over to my right here. Um, one of the things that I always found interesting was the reaction of every Union and Confederate soldier who came through this part of Pennsylvania. Number one, everybody was allegedly Dutch, even though it was Scotch-Irish coming through here to settle this area. Um, the people of Harrisburg treated the their defenders who came here to what we call the Department of the Susquehanna, which was nothing but a paper department until really uh, late June of 1863. And whenever these men from New York and Massachusetts come down here to help protect the state capital of Pennsylvania, what do these good people of Harrisburg do? They raise the food prices on all of them. But you come to like Carlisle and other parts of South Central Pennsylvania and they're treated so much differently. And in fact, over at Wrightsville, there's even a, a feast for J John Gordon's brigade of Confederates because they helped to put out a fire that almost engulfed their town. So you see different reactions around here. But one of the reasons that the Confederates are so um, knowledgeable about this area is because this was a military outpost since the French and Indian War. Um, General Forbes marched out to take the Forks of the Ohio, my hometown of Pittsburgh in the 1750s. Then you would have Pontiac's Rebellion being put down from out here. Henry Bouquet goes out to play battle at a place called Bushy Run out near Pittsburgh. And then you also have Hessians here held as prisoners during the Revolutionary War. The Quartermaster Department was here for a while for the Continental Army. So we see this as a military post. And in 1838, we established, the United States Army does, a CAV school here to train uh, the horsemen for the United States Army. It is not what we think of today as like the airborne school or these specialty schools at like Fort Knox or out at Fort Leavenworth. This was truly teaching guys how to get on a horse, how to pull their saber out, how to basically march in formations. And the early men who are going to train them will come down largely from West Point. When it was founded in 1838, the first commandant of the Cav School is Edwin Sumner. You may know him famously from the West Woods at Antietam. Um, he will command the school on two different occasions. You have a guy named Andrew Porter here who commanded the U.S. regulars at a place called First Bull Run, and then he goes on to become the Provost Guard under uh, George McClellan. Um, Philip St. George Cook is here during this time. He is the father of John Rogers Cook, who is a Confederate general who's wounded five times during the war, and he is the father-in-law of Jeb Stuart. Um, there's some controversy that takes place here because there's a young lady named Flora Cook, and she gets engaged to a guy named Beverly Robertson, and Robertson and Stuart hate one another, and in fact, this will play out later on because Stuart gets married to Flora, but the rivalry will carry into the Gettysburg campaign and Stuart will not play well with Robertson and leave him behind and not with the army where he should be. Even though Robertson's kind of a prickly character, um, you see a lot of these interactions that have taken place here at Carlisle or in the vicinity here. Um, we'll also see other officers from the Lee's Army, Northern Virginia. Richard Yule, as Chris mentioned, um, came here. He mentioned he came in a, in a carriage. Well, it's because he lost his leg during the second battle, or right before the second battle of Manassas at a place called Groveton. Um, but he could still get on a horse, they said. They'd strap him to a horse and he could ride across the plains like an Indian, is how they said, um, even though he still only had one leg. Another one of his brigade commanders, a guy named Alfred Iverson, which most of you know from July 1st, 1863, not doing so well up near Oak Hill and Oak Ridge. He was here at one point. 
And then we would have Fitzhugh Lee through here, a guy named John Shambliss. And during the time of the shelling of Carlisle, when Yule comes through here, he leaves the barracks, which is just down the road from us, which had 11 buildings at the time, untouched. And he goes out of his way to say in his official report, I didn't burn the town, I didn't shell the town, that wasn't me. Um, and then Stuart comes in and he burns um, all but four buildings when he comes into town. He will burn, he will not burn two supply buildings for whatever reason. He won't take down the guard post, which was built during the Revolutionary War and was just too sturdy to be taken down. And then Fitzhugh Lee will not take down one of the officer's quarters, which was overtaken by one of the adjutants at the time serving the U.S. Army because he was an old West Point friend. So he was, I think it was uh, Lieutenant McGregor, I believe was his name. So we see these interpersonal relationships come about here. They burn all but four of those buildings. The 4th Virginia Cav was actually stationed right there. And later on in the 1870s, the last full commandant of the Cav school here will be Edwin Sumner Jr., who was Ed's son who served in the Civil War and goes on to become a major general in the Spanish-American War. In fact, Sumner has two sons who are generals in the Span Am War. Um, after that, they are going to start moving towards the west. And from here, this, uh, this school will be moved out to Fort Jefferson. Um, and that is because the planes are opening up. So the Cav School kind of gets left behind. Fast forward to today, it is now a training facility for the United States Army. This is where our field grade officers, majors, colonels, lieutenant colonels will come here. They will train to learn the inner uh, workings of the hierarchy of warfare. Specifically, they're gonna study guys like Jomini, Clausewitz. One of our good friends, Doug Dowds, is a professor there. So today it is still used by the United States Army, but this was the first command school created for the CAV in 1838 and that's what brings a lot of these guys here and a lot of warm feelings for Carlisle even though the town is eventually shelled. Uh, let me just add real quick that I, I hope that coming to a place like this and having experience now y'all so many places on the campaign that this puts things into perspective Chris you know what why you know in the Gettysburg movie it's I cannot imagine what has become of General Stewart well we know where General Stewart was during the battle during the better part of the yeah. battle of Gettysburg and for part of that he's here in Carlisle Pennsylvania anything else to add sir yeah I, I would just add that uh, Stewart made mistakes so did Lee during this Lee Lee remember though is working off of his old intelligence where two other times Jeb Stewart rode around the Union Cav or the Union Army. He did it in three days and then four days respectively in 1862 twice. Then he's like, hey, let's do this again. But the problem was the Union Army was moving at this time and it'll take almost eight days for Stewart to keep riding, trying to find where the Confederate Army is, find where the Union Army is, and then come back to there uh, and, and get to, to Lee on July 2nd, 1863 in Gettysburg. So He's also bringing along supply wagon supplies. It's it's not Jeb Stewart's finest moment. He'll make up for it, believe me. Not everybody has a perfect battle. We see that time and again. But in this case, Jeb Stewart let down Robert E. Lee, and Lee did to let himself down as well because he has more cav units. There are seven cav brigades in the Army of Northern Virginia during this campaign. They're not set up properly. They should be in what we call a core system versus division. That's for another video. But Jeb Stewart didn't leave the cream of the crop back with Robert E. Lee. And even though he left Cav with him, Lee doesn't use him properly. He doesn't trust some of them because they're regular troops. And Stuart takes off with the best and the brightest. And then the last thing I'll add into is, if you want to see the fallout of the last two campaigns here in Pennsylvania on the Army of the Potomac, look no farther than Edwin Voss Sumner, who used to command this Cav school. He resigned because Joe Hooker took over the army in January of 63, though he dies in March of 63, uh, about to head out west. We have Darius Couch. He was the second in command of the Army of the Potomac at Chancellorsville. I can't work with Joe Hooker. Release me. He's now in the backwater. We have a guy out the Department of Monongahela named Billy uh, uh, Bully Brooks. He lost his job because of a battle called Salem Church. We have Baldy Smith, who lost his job because of Fredericksburg and a coup of the generals in January of 1863. So when you start to read about these officers and where they go, some of them ended up in these backwaters and are here with militia troops trying to hold back the best and brightest of the Army of Northern Virginia. It is not the finest of the Army of the Potomac up here because they're nowhere to be found. They're still in Maryland. Uh, 
Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Now, before we leave, we are gonna we might cut, end up cutting this out, but I'm hoping that Chris will lift this thing up and show us, Courtney, show us Chris one more time and show us the tight quarters in which we are uh, trying to operate here. I can't stress enough how thankful we are of, uh, you know, the uh, Chris Jones for setting up our access here with the kind people um, uh, here at the courthouse who were able to allow us up here. We hope you have uh, enjoyed this coverage. We hope you come up to Carlisle uh, if you haven't been and if you have, if you have been, See it again for the first time. I'm Gary Edelman, Chris White behind the camera here with the Barefoot Historian Courtney, as well as Chris Jones um, of Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Thanks so much for watching and for supporting battlefield preservation and education.